I was able to take all of this communication training I'd learned over the years, because that was always what I sought out when it came to continuing education and apply it to increasing case acceptance. What I realize now is they're not just an information receptacle in the chair waiting for us to just dump all of our amazing knowledge on them. Yes, they came to us and chose us because we have a unique ability and a skill to help them, but they want to be treated like a person who has their own feelings and motives and agenda. Coming from ambivalence is the hardest thing to overcome. Those patients that are just there because they're supposed to be there, but they don't really know why. Now I know my job during that appointment is to help build the value of what we do. We might not be working towards case acceptance that visit because right now we're starting at just valuing this profession in general. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists, episode number 228. My name is Andrew. And this is Michelle. Welcome back. Glad you're here. All that yeah. jazz. <laughs> to a dental podcast of of sorts. Of sorts. Of us too. Uh, I feel like we've told our story so many times that like everyone knows it, but it still surprised me when people were like, wait a second, you guys didn't know each other. And like you didn't you didn't even meet before you actually made this podcast. And here you are, like almost five years later. <laughs> like Are we gonna is that what we're gonna do right now? Is just a, a quick recap of No, I don't know why that just popped in my head, but I just think that that's funny because somebody else said that to me. I, I think it was this week, and they were just like, God, I didn't realize that was y'all's story. And I was like, Yeah, uh this it's is a, the it's not that great of a story though. <laughs> it is, it is that great of a story. So there's two things that's happened to me in my life. One, I had a best friend that I got from a Craigslist ad to be my roommate. And <laughs> Like, Wait, 10 years that? ago, that was Aaron, um, that moved in and like, it was only for two months until like, she, she's a teacher and she was like starting the school year and she was moving down from New York. And then she ended up like staying with me as my roommate and went everywhere. I went for like six years. <laughs> After that. <laughs> and then you and me where we meet on Facebook randomly like, Hey, why are you on it? Why are you in this podcast group? I don't know. Why are you in this podcast group? And here we are five years later, business owners. Mm. It's just crazy. Well, I remember the first phone call that we had because I was at work. I think it might even have been a Saturday because my boss was not in the office and it was like the end going into my lunch break. So I'm like, hey, hang on, hang on a quick second. Let me go clock out. And then I went to my boss's office and sat in her really comfy chair and we just talked. It was almost an hour long. And I'm like, hey, my lunch break is over. I have to go. <laughs> um, but this has been a great conversation. Let's maybe do a podcast together. <laughs> I remember uh, saying, I want to have a very back and forth, funny, humorous relationship where you can be like, Michelle, you're a fat cow today. And you're going to be like, I'll never call you a fat cow. And then I'm pretty sure you've called me dumb and so many other things. Dude, <laughs> physical attributes I'll never make fun of. Your intellect. Absolutely. <laughs> I have no problem. But I do remember that because you're like, and I was like shocked. I'm like, I will uh, never say those things. Cause and I was like, that, that, this is the kind of real relationship that I want to have. That's truly like you can see it, hear it, feel it on a podcast that we're friends. Yeah. We'll call each other out on stuff all the time, which, you know, we haven't had a real good argument on the on the podcast in a hot minute either, which is what these intros used to be was just you and I, I bickering back and forth. <laughs> <about> <laughs> hey, let me tell you how you're wrong this week, Michelle. I have a but, list. I kept I've a list of everything you've missed. Too, yes. But I think too, we've grown so much because of this podcast yeah. as clinicians that we are able to see that dentistry isn't black or white and your way and my way being different aren't wrong. They're just different because our demographics are different and our patient population's different and our offices are different and our state's mm -hmm. practice acts are different. And if you've listened from the beginning, I'm sure you can see and oh, anybody who's like i started at podcast number one i'm like oh oof. yipes it gets oh, better I, yeah just <laughs> hang in there i promise it gets better i well, you know if i could say though i do think that if anyone listening is considering like developing this type of like 
business relationship or even a new friendship or things like that. I love how we started ours. I love that conversation of here's expectations. I demand honesty and transparency. I demand these things. Are you on board? Yeah. And that is kind of one of the, well, I think it was like the second or third conversation we had was like, okay, let's detail like who's going to be doing what, what is the role? Who's going to do, you know, there's a defining of the roles that needs to happen. And that should happen in your offices too. I feel like, I mean, so the true. dentist should define their role. The auxiliary staff should define their roles and it doesn't necessarily have to be like, I'm the leader and you guys are all the peons. That's not how it is No. but it, let's say there's one assistant that loves doing endo and has zero complaints. Most assistants hate it. Well, that could be their role. They could be defined in, I am going to take care of the endo cart and I'm going to make sure we have all of our order supply or our like supplies. Like empower order. them in that, right? Yeah. Like really just like, but having that transparency and that ability to have those honest conversations at the get go yeah. is super, super great. And you weren't offended by my words. I was never offended by your words at those beginning because that was a time to opt out. I was like, well, maybe that's not what I want. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I think that that's something that we have always been very good at. And I think we did luck out in a way to find two people that were pretty genuine, altruistic and aren't in it for not that in it for the money is like, we were just in it like, Hey, let's just make our profession better. And I think if you, if you had shown up being like, I, I need to make bukus of money on this. And I'm like, uh, well, I'm, I'm not, or vice versa. I don't, I think, I think our ideologies and our mission for this podcast, were always pretty aligned, even though our strengths are very different. I think our mission mm -hmm. has been pretty aligned. And if you are thinking of doing that business, uh, like he, you were just saying, like doing some kind of business, uh, event, it's, it's more of like defining your why and your mission and then empowering each other in the, in your strengths. I think we do a good job of that. Yeah. I, and again, I think that we lucked into something that not mm -hmm. a lot of people are going to luck into, but yeah, hooray for True. us. True. I, all this conversation is leading really well into our topic for this uh, episode. Yeah. However, can we digress one quick minute? Because I don't know if I've read this iTunes review and I'm really sorry. I meant Apple podcast review after I busted your oh. chops on that last time. <laughs> Apple podcast review from Lucy, five stars. She said, wow. Not only do I appreciate everything I listen to on ATOF, now I want a mouthwatch intraoral camera. I have some oh, homebound yeah. patients, and this would be beneficial for the practice I work for to keep up with their oral care. Keep providing us the current topics that keep us at cutting edge of dental hygiene. And if I read this before, I'm really sorry, but like it was. I don't um, think so because wow, she did win that Thank mouthwatch you. camera because we do, we were having some episodes where mouthwatch was giving away a camera and that was awesome. So I'm so glad that she was a winner and we really do appreciate the uh, review as well. Thank you, yeah. Lucy. That's awesome. But you're right. This is leading right into um, our podcast today with Miranda Beeson. And even though this is in the implant series, we talk about implants um, and case acceptance because sometimes it's a little bit of an awkward conversation to have with a patient because that's a big dollar amount that comes with the mm -hmm. implant. And, th and that's just one. Think about if you're doing a bridge or, you know, extracting and doing big surgeries and bone grafts and sinus lifts. And then you do a fixed process. I mean, those are like tens and tens of thousands of dollars. So I've always been very uncomfortable with that conversation. And Miranda is now getting her certification or her has her certification in the disc assessment that you and I took. And you can listen back to Corey Jameson Keel's uh, episode the last November or go to our Facebook page and watch that live. And what she uses and the how she approaches the patient, how she teaches her team to approach the patients is pretty amazing. So we talked a little bit about perio and implants, but just the idea about building case acceptance around most treatment plans, quite honestly. So I really do hope that you guys take something from this podcast today with Miranda Beeson. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. So listeners, this is going to be a really important, but uh, maybe a conversation that we don't always have. And it's going to be kind of centered around case acceptance and how do you have these conversations? And if you're anything like me, you are super awkward and uncomfortable the entire time you do it. <laughs> 
<laughs> but we have an amazing guest on uh, Miranda. Miranda, thank you so much for coming on. You've been a longtime listener, first time guest. <laughs> That's right. I'm excited. I'm excited. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about you and your journey and how you got to be so good at case acceptance. I'm excited to help uh, share some of that with you. So first I want to say too, just thanks for having me on and chatting about this. I always say in the world of continuing education and dental hygiene, I often feel like, you know, that guy at the gym, the stereotype where he's like super buff up top, but he's got like the little toothpick legs. Yeah. <laughs> like, I feel like we buff out that clinical side of our brain so much with dental hygiene, continuing education. And there's that business component and that communication component that just doesn't get exercised or informed enough. So I commend you. I've been listening. You've had a lot of these recently with emotional intelligence and DISC. So thanks for having me and allowing me to share. Yeah, of course. But you're a hygienist first. Yeah. Yes. So um, I graduated in 2003 from Old Dominion University here in Virginia. I live in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And then the following year in 2004, I graduated with my master's degree in emphasis in marketing and education. I didn't know, you know, which route I wanted to go. After that, I did have a quick jaunt in the corporate world, which was fun, but I missed being clinical, which is really what I wanted to do. I wanted to have like a solid decade of clinical hygiene under my belt before I really transitioned out of it. And I didn't really know what that was going to look like necessarily, but over the years, I had the ability to work with some fabulous doctors at great practices. And after a period of time, I had an opportunity to kind of fall in my lap and it coincided right along with some ergonomic distresses that I was having. And it was like the door opened at just the right time. Um, and I was able to transition from clinical hygiene and being an implant care practitioner into an implant care coordinator role within the practice. And so I transitioned into working with the doctors to do large case presentations and then all of our implant case presentations. So through that, I was able to take all of this communication training I'd learned over the years, because that was always what I sought out when it came to continuing education and apply it to increasing case acceptance. And it's worked very well. And now I pass it on to my team. I'm a practice manager now. I oversee three offices here in Virginia Beach, and I help the team and the hygienists with motivational interviewing and guiding patients into behavior change and treatment acceptance. Man, Andrew, you have something? I feel like your brain is no, <laughs> no, I'm like, dang, that's a lot of stuff. It's a lot. It's so fun though. I, I don't feel like it's exhausting or just, I have such a passion for it. And I love this side of the dental profession so much. And I think it's something that's so, like I said, underdeveloped and under appreciated, undernourished because we can all do so much better than I think what we're doing. If we put the effort in as much into that as we do learning new clinical techniques and things of that nature, which is also very important. I don't negate that at all, but I think that there's a communication aspect that it, it, it's going to change. It's a game changer when you're working with your patients. So when did you kind of realize how important the communication aspect was? <laughs> so when I look back, <laughs> I can pinpoint like a moment, but I think oh. I didn't realize it at the time. So there is a patient that I think of every time a question like that is spawned. So I remember having a new patient and I had that one hour visit and, you know, you just start taking your x-rays while you're like chit chatting, like, oh, I'm going to get to know you and do seven things at once. And I immediately see that he has wear just all over his teeth. He's obviously got a functional issue as I'm taking his x-rays. I'm already like, so have you ever thought about wearing a night guard? It looks like you have some brexing issues, you know, just pushing it, just going like, let me let him know that I see this and just inform him as much as possible. And he, he just threw this wall up and snatched his napkin off and climbed out of the chair and almost ran down the hallway out of the office because uh, he's been told this before. I don't need you to lecture me about the wear on my teeth. Oh, we've, you had know, I didn't, a lot of I those didn't, patients. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you don't take the time to really get to know who they are and their communication style and that history, and that was really my fault. And in that moment, I was very inward mindset and what's his problem? I'm just here to help and I have all the answers, right? But looking back, I can see where that was really my error in terms of how I was communicating with that patient. And so after leaving that office, I didn't realize it in that moment, but I transitioned to another office that 
for four and a half years, all of our continuing education as a group was on emotional intelligence. It was on behavioral assessment. It was on treatment acceptance, asking open-ended questions. And that's when the light bulb went off. Like, oh, like that guy, along with like my last seven years of patient, they were jerks. <laughs> I just wasn't communicating properly. <laughs> So what was that? You just said that he had a certain mindset. What did you call yeah. it? So um, it's an inward mindset versus an outward mindset. So there's a book and it's like, I think everyone should just have it as a Bible in their life. And it's called The Outward Mindset. It's by the Arbinger Institute. And it really just helps you realize that in any situation, but when it comes to our world as dental hygienists, that it, you know it can't just be about our agenda and how we feel affected by things. We have to be looking at how do our call, like how is our role affecting our colleagues? How is it affecting our patients? And really looking at things from an outward perspective, pushing towards the patient's agenda versus our own agenda. And just always trying to make sure that we're keeping them in front of mind, not just the checklist that we're trying to get through in that appointment or the information that we want to educate upon them. But, you know, what do they want to hear? What changes do they want to make? What's their motivation? And if you just flip that mindset to make it more about them than about you, that's where it all really begins. So when you're teaching your team this, like, how do you go about that? Like, where are the steps that you need to, like, number one, and if I'm going to approach my patient differently now, like, what's that first step? I think that the easiest thing is ask more questions. So ask more and talk less. I think that we don't ask enough questions. Um, patients are not information receptacles. It's like my favorite that. term. I have it literally. <laughs> I have your name under quotations in a presentation because it's the best thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but if you picture that visually, right, like your patient sitting in the chair, just like this little trash receptacle and you're just like jumping <laughs> all of your like schooling and knowledge on them because, you know, I, I, I graduated like I'm going to go change the world. I just received this degree. I have all this information. I was top of my class. I'm amazing. People didn't care. They didn't want to hear it, you know? So what I realize now is they're not just an information receptacle in the chair waiting for us to just dump all of our amazing knowledge on them. Yes, they came to us and chose us because we have a unique ability and a skill to help them. But they want to be treated like a person who has their own feelings and motives and agenda. So I think you can't know those things about your patient if you don't ask them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just clearly basing everything off of assumptions. Do you feel, though, like when you're asking those questions, there's a particular type of question that's better? So, for example, getting to know the name of their dog, like, is that more important than understanding their lifestyle or the, the reasons why they're having the, the symptoms or the problems with their mouth? I love that you asked that question because I also often say you have to know your patient, but you don't need to necessarily know their kids' names and when the wedding is and how, you know, how old their dog is. Those things are amazing. And I, and I actually love that component of being a dental hygienist and forming those relationships, but it needs to be a very small percentage of what it is that we're talking to build that relationship. The questions need to really focus more on exactly what you just mentioned is just like, what are their motives? So we actually document in every single patient's chart what their oral health goal is. So we'll just ask them when we start an appointment, this is my first time seeing you. I'm curious, what are your expectations of our visit today? And then you get a little mindset on where they are. Like, I just, oh, I just come here every six months to check the box because I'm supposed to, or... Well, you know, Danielle that I saw last time told me I was having some concerns on this lower left-hand side and I want to see how they're doing. You know, those those two answers give you a very clear depiction of a difference between what's going to be happening moving forward. Am I starting at ground level or am I starting at a very engaged and already um, interested patient? Coming from ambivalence is the hardest thing to overcome. Those patients that are just there because they're supposed to be there, but they don't really know why. Now I know my job during that appointment is to help build the value of what we do. We might not be working towards case acceptance that visit because right now we're starting at just valuing this profession in general. What are the starting points for those people that are a little bit more ambivalent in those first couple of appointments that will get them interested to what you have to say later for case acceptance? So I think 
the main thing is really helping them to discover that they can have an oral health goal. You know, that's something that their medical providers probably have chatted with them about or a dietitian or a diabetic specialist. And so in that same capacity, if we think of ourselves as healthcare providers, um, that's not going to be an unusual question for us to ask. However, it's going to be unusual for the patient because they've definitely never been asked it before at the dental office. I will say the, the majority of the time when I ask a patient, so tell me, what are your goals for your teeth and mouth? Or what are your oral health goals? They're like, what do you mean? And a lot of times <laughs> yeah. you end up with, I just want to be healthy. That's probably like the most common answer. Or I want to keep my teeth, which both great answers, <laughs> but we need a little bit more than that in order to know how to tailor our recommendations. So then my follow-up question would be, well, tell me what healthy means to you. Because for one person, it might mean not getting cavities. You know, maybe they come from a family where their parents lost their teeth due to decay. So for them, they don't think about periodontal disease or concerns at all. They're clearly only thinking about decay as dental disease. So for some person, healthy might mean avoiding decay. But for somebody else, healthy might mean perfectly white, straight teeth, pink gums, three millimeter pockets. <laughs> you know, everybody comes from a different starting point. And so without clarifying that, and a lot of times if you're stuck, a really key phrase is just to ask them, well, tell me more about that. So if you don't follow up with, well, what does healthy mean to you? Or if they answer in a different way that you can't lead in with that follow-up question, just follow up with, tell me more about that. And then they can open up a little bit more about where they got that answer from and what that means to them. I love that. I do too. I, I well, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's been a long time since I've been on a date, but I feel like it's the same thing with dating. It's like, <laughs> you can't just like tell all of your things and then just be done with it. Like you have to engage in the conversation, get them to say their side of it, which is really important. Well, and let's be honest, we all like to be heard. So <laughs> that's true. You know, if you're just talking at a patient, like they may think, oh, my hygienist is the nicest. She's always so funny and, you know, whatever else. But like, did you really get to know that person? So the more you listen, the more value they feel in the relationship that you're forming. And then there's more dedication to you, more dedication to your practice, more likely to get internal referrals and have them send friends and family your way because, hey, these people really listen. They really get me. Like, this is where I'm supposed to be. So the turnover of your patients is going to diminish if you're taking that time to foster the communication side of the relationship. Can I ask more questions? Michelle, yeah. I know I like I wasn't <laughs> supposed to be on this one and all of a sudden I just like asking all the questions. I'm sorry, Michelle. No, this is because I've heard Miranda speak. So <laughs> oh, like Michelle, I, I like that you, yeah, we've had this before and I, I do love that. Um, every time I've heard little tidbits from you or I read another motivational interview viewing book, um, I'll go and apply it. And it's, it's like an experiment to me because yes. I don't do it right always. <laughs> nope. And I still don't. <laughs> I screw it up um, a lot or I learn something about that particular patient where I'm like, okay, I see like when he sat down, they did this specific mm -hmm. thing. So when I, that happens again, I'm like, okay, maybe let me just, let me test what I did on that dude on this one and see if that works. So this whole thing is like a big, ex a social experiment. It it's a behavioral it. social experiment every day. Yeah. So I'm actually glad you're on this, Andrew, because I'm like just taking it in and like replaying in my head, like, how am I going to use this next time? And I don't know if I'm going to ask critical thinking questions like you are right now. <laughs> Well, and, and Miranda, if you have like an agenda, feel free to take us in that direction. But like, before we get there, like my other question about this is I keep hearing about how important like body language is and like body positioning. And as you're trying to have these conversations, what have you found to be, I don't want to say like the best, cause I feel like that it kind of adapts, but what are some really good things to think about as far as like our body language and our positioning? So you kind of bring up a great point. And it's part of, if you want to call it my agenda today, my agenda, but it, it really goes back into the disc side of things. So I'm going to talk back for just a second to what Michelle mentioned, which was motivational interviewing. So I want to make sure that we talk a little bit about that too. Um, and then I'll wrap around to what you're asking, Andrew. So those open-ended questions and listening to your patient and opening the door of communication, those follow-up questions that I just mentioned, they really stem from the concept of motivational interviewing. And so 
yes, there's a body language component that tailors a little bit more from their personality styles. The motivational interviewing side that started over 30 years ago in drug management programs. Um, now it's being used in physical therapy and diabetic, like dietary changes, things of that nature. It's, it's being used across the board medically. So transitioning into dentistry makes complete sense. It, it's a way to motivate behavioral change. And you're doing that through asking open-ended questions, finding out what the motivators are for your patient, and then listening. And I often say the hardest part is just like, stop talking, Shut and up. listen. <laughs> And listen to really listen. It's so hard because you're like, okay, I have an answer for that. I have an answer. For yeah. That. But you know, if you, if you just slow down and I encourage people to ask three questions before you give information. So if you ask a question, don't immediately like lead into the next one, ask at least three follow-up questions. Cause there are layers upon layers behind the decision-making with patients and their motivation. And you can actively listen in a lot of different ways. A lot of times the easiest thing to do is just reflecting back what they say. So, you know, if they, if they tell you like, oh, I really wish I had more time to focus on flossing. I'm just so busy. It sounds to me like you would like to incorporate flossing. It's just life is busy for you. And then you stop talking and you pause (laughs) and it's a little awkward, But when you know that you're the one creating that pause for a reason, they're going to break the silence. So just sit tight for a few seconds, count in your head if you have to, and they will give you more information. And if you phrase it in a way that's not a question, it's going to open the door for them to extend that paragraph and give you the next point of information. So that's often the hardest part is just wait. And you sit there kind of awkwardly, but it's okay because you're in control. It's fine. And then they'll (laughs) give you a little something else. And then, then you're just going to be able to inform because at that point they've given you more information. You, you ask permission, then, you know, is it okay with you if I share some ideas that have worked for other people? Or can I, can we brainstorm together some thoughts that you think might work better than maybe flossing at night? Like what other ideas do you have and put it, put it in their court, let them own it versus you just telling them what to do. That's good. So with that being said, you then have to tailor it to their communication style. And that comes into body language too. So you're going to position yourself differently and kind of make different eye contact, lean in, lean back, elevate your voice, lower your voice. You're going to shift it based on that person's personality style. And so we actually track that as well and document it in our patients' charts so that we can know before they come back, like, okay, I'm going to be with a D. And I'm sure that your listeners know all about DISC because you had a podcast not too long ago with Corey. Um, She's the one who certified me through her um, program with Custom Dental Solutions. And again, great minds think alike. I just met her and was like, oh, we're going to be best friends. I just know yeah, all the way across the country, but that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, if you know what their DISC personality style is, you have it documented in their chart. You know, when the person's coming back, Joe's on his way back. He's an I, I got to pump up the energy for this appointment, you know, (laughs) a little chit chat time at the beginning to catch up because we have to be, you know, friends because that's what eyes do. And then you can kind of get forward with your appointment with them. It's all about confidence and energy and a casual approach where if I have a C or a very conscientious patient in my chair, who's all about details and research and information and questions, I want to position my body in more of a state of, I don't know, it's not necessarily authority, but confidence. it's very important to, to reflect confidence when you're in the room with a D or a C really. Mm. S is I like to, you guys can't see me right now because we're on audio, but you want to lean in you know, soften your tone, slow your pace. It's all about building trust with an S. So I would highly encourage anyone who's going to try to grow the communication side of their chair side, either OHI or relationship building case acceptance into understanding a little bit more the disc side of things, personality assessment with your patient. You cannot deliver the information the same verbally or through body language for every patient to be successful. Can I also just circle back to motivational interviewing? Because the one thing that I learned as I've been applying this for the last few years is it takes so much practice. It oh, is most definitely. It is not easy. It's not one of those things where you're like, okay, three questions. I can do that because you have to like reteach yourself how to process 
what they just said and put it like parrot it back out. Like that is a, a learned, trained skill. It is very challenging. And often, like you said, kind of misconceived like, oh yeah, that's easy. I'll go start doing that on Monday. But when you have to shift from informing all the time to questioning, like that in itself is hard enough, but then making sure that those questions are open-ended. Yeah. Okay. That's next level. (laughs) And then you can't just use the same questions. You have to tailor it to the Mm -hmm. individualized conversation that's happening. And as we all know, every single conversation we have is not a duplicate of another. So oftentimes we joke about this. Our hygiene team um, works really hard on this and we'll be working in a patient's mouth instrumenting. You might be going around with the ultrasonic or whatever it may be. And while you're doing that, you're running through in your head, like, okay, how am I going to tackle that broken tooth on the upper left that we've recommended a crown for the last three visits? Like, how are we going to get that state of ambivalence shifted today? And so, you know, cause I mean, in reality, once you've been working for a long period of time as a clinical hygienist, you could blindfolded probably ultrasonic someone's mouth. <laughs> so you're don't do that, but you could, um, <laughs> I'm not recommending that. But in reality, that's when your mind can be then processing those thoughts and those questions and you're practicing it, rehearsing it. And in our office, we do, we practice it. We, every huddle in the morning ends with a 10 minute session of like scripting and role-playing each team, the assistants, the business team, the hygiene team, each, each week they have a topic and Mm -hmm. every day at the end of huddle, it's okay. We're going to handle patient objections today, or we're going to talk about closing a case. How do you ask those close closing questions? Like whatever it may be, the hygiene team actually did kind of like a book club with motivational interviewing for healthcare. And they meet once a month as they normally would during their team meetings. They reserve a component of that team meeting for reviewing whatever chapters that they focused on that month. And then they talk about any cases or opportunities that either went well using motivational interviewing techniques or things that they feel like could have utilized them, but they didn't know where to go. And then they pick Mm -hmm. each other's brains because we're all at different levels here in our practice. We're at different levels of, of, I guess, achievement in that so far. Some of us has been doing it longer than others. And some people pick up on it faster than others. So we rely on each other within our team to help each other and coach each other through it. The thing I, um, I get pushed back a lot when I talk about motivational interview, not, well, not just motivational interviewing, but, but, you know, I'll have somebody say, I've been doing this for 30 years. These patients don't want to brush their teeth. They don't want to do this. Like, this isn't going to work. Like I've tried everything. I'm like, y'all, they got people to stop doing cocaine with motivational <laughs> interview. Like you think we could get them to brush their teeth by just giving it a try. Like, <laughs> That is it's such like, a great analogy. I think I'm going to use that. Please do. Cause I'm like, in what <laughs> world do you think we can get people to stop doing drugs, but you think that we can't apply this to toothbrushing? Like, come on. Yes. <laughs> no, I love that so much. And it's so true. And as we all know, like dead in the water phrase is like, that's just the way I've always done it. Yes. But I would twofold. Sometimes people say that because they think like everything's fine. Like my patients mm-hmm. love me. They're fine. They don't question it. But like, I would put a bet on if you polled those patients, how many of them don't necessarily like have undiscovered goals or thoughts about their health or like how many times I've had patients call our office because we have a cosmetic dentist on practice that come to us and say, like, can you tell me about veneers? Well, do you have a current provider? I do, but I don't think he does that. But maybe he does, but they've Mm. never even talked about it because they didn't uncover from this patient that they wanted that. They didn't create the space for the patient to share their concerns or their goals. And so I think sometimes when when hygienists say that, because I've been confronted with the same thing, I think sometimes they don't recognize that there actually is a failure in their system. The patients just haven't shared it yet. I think sometimes patients even leave and convert to other offices because they're seeking something out. And then it's that patient you're like, I wonder whatever happened to them. And it might just be that they didn't have the experience they wanted to have when they were with you. Not that you weren't nice, right? But sometimes another phrase I love being nice isn't always being nice. So you can be nice to someone, but that's not necessarily going to get them where they want to be. If you have a, a patient who has you know, localized periodontal infection. 
There's a lot of times when you mentioned that uncomfortableness that hygienists mm-hmm. have with talking about case acceptance, mm-hmm. that's a big one. A lot of people, it is our area of expertise, but they're uncomfortable telling a patient you have disease and this is how we would treat it. And so to be nice and soften the blow really isn't helpful to that patient. It's not nice in the end because three months from now, six from, months from now, if they haven't moved forward with that therapy, now they have a whole quadrant of periodontal disease versus a localized infection. So I think that it's easy to just say, like, I've always done it this way. It works really well. They just don't care or whatever it may be. A lot of times I think they just maybe don't know. And it's really our job to share that with them. But I would like to see a shift. And what I try to do is shift from sharing that with them in an authoritative teacher to student model and transitioning it to a really great visual is just sitting on the same side of the table, looking at a problem and coming up together with a solution because they're going to have a lot more ownership in it than if I just tell them, here's your problem and then tell them, here's how you fix it and then send them out the door. There's not going to be that same level of ownership from their end and the final, you know, the backside, they have to go home and they have to apply this for, you know, 90 days or hopefully not more than 90 days if they have infection, but sometimes six months. So, you know, it's, it's our job to make sure that they're bought in, but not through, you're you're not going to get that buy-in through shaming or lecturing or, you know, just again, throwing information at them. That's, it's not going to work. And that's been proven over time. Proven, proven. I think we've probably all experienced it. I mean, again, I shared my yeah. story. I definitely experienced it. I mean, or, or scare tactics. I feel like scare tactics were something of the eighties and the nineties and stuff growing up. Yeah. Well, and I think yeah. there's a difference between like being scary or aggressive. You can still be polite and be very assertive or real with people. So I don't want to brag, but my patients, like they love me, but I'm very real with them about their disease. It's not, I, I don't, there's a little bit of bleeding over here. It's very much like you have bleeding, you have bone loss, or you're losing jawbone around your teeth. Does that concern you? Or what concerns you about that? Because that's what's actually happening. <laughs> you know, when we have bone loss, it's not like, oh, there's just a little bit of, a little bit of bone loss over here. Well, that's the jawbone that holds your teeth in place. And when you say it in that way, it doesn't have to be scary. It can be very polite and very just real. Um, And then what concerns that about you? We use that phrase a lot in our office when we're, because we do a lot of, um, which brings us to another thing that I didn't even think about, but like co-discovery and co-diagnosis, you know, having images for your patient to see, you know, asking them, what do you see here? And then let them, they may say like, I have no idea what I'm looking at. Please just tell me what's going on. Well, now they've opened the door at least and offered you that permission. Or they might say like, that looks horrendous. What is that big black thing over there? And like, what, you know, like that's in my mouth. And so then it's like, yeah, what, you know, what concerns you about that? Well, what the heck is it? And what do we do about it? You know, the more you involve them and ask, and they might say, I'm not concerned about it at all. It's fine. At least now, you know (laughs) where you're starting (laughs) and where you, where to kind of go from there. But most of the time, you know, when you, when you present it in a way that involves them, they're, they're going to jump on board a lot faster. And like with periodontal assessments, and I know we talked, we were going to talk a little bit about implants as we go along, but let's just talk chair side, like periodontal assessments. If you just jump in there and start probing secretly behind their back, typing things in the computer. And they're just laying there like this hurts, (laughs) you know, they're not involved in the process. So, you know, what we do with our hygiene team is we um, have a a little script. Again, we we do this in our huddles and practice it. We're going to be taking a look now at the health of your gums and bone. You're going to be listening for numbers. These numbers mean things are healthy. These numbers mean they're not. If it's uncomfortable, which it might be in some areas. Take note of where that's uncomfortable. That means there's likely infection present. Go through that with every patient prior to the assessment. And then when you're done and you sit up and you have that periodontal chart there in front of them and they can see all the red dots and all the red numbers. And then you say, so here's the chart. I know this looks like a little bit of mumbo jumbo to you, but anywhere red is an area of concern. So based on this and based on what we chatted about that you'd be listening for and feeling for, 
what thoughts do you have about your assessment? And let them tell you, you know, where they're at with things instead of just jumping right into telling them about their disease. And then they start going, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. I have this disease and they just shut down. And then you're kind of like an uphill battle from there. So if you can involve them the whole way, you know, they're on board with it. They're, they're there with you. So how does this all go into the conversation you would have for a patient that is in need of dental implants? Because I'm a big proponent that there is a lot of conversations that need to go down before the placement of dental implants. (laughs) I would agree with you in that statement. I have no doubt. (laughs) So it's really, you kind of start in the same place, really. I think it's really important to know your patient's goals, know their motivating factors, understand their particular communication style. So again, that takes us back to that disc and you might not know their driving forces, but you at least have an idea of how to communicate with them. And then you can even discern, is this someone who one is going to want a dental implant? Is this someone who's going to maintain and take care of a dental implant and the way that it should be? Are they, you know, an appropriate choice, not just from having adequate bone, but from being able to prevent disease long-term. And even if they're not historically someone who was able to do that, at least you'll have the opportunity to work with them to see if there's someone who will kind of build into understanding and, and being able to be work through that motivational interviewing process to develop the skills needed to maintain it. So I, I know a lot of people will say like, if someone has a history of periodontal disease, they're not an implant candidate, or if someone is a heavy smoker, they're not an implant candidate. But in reality, if we didn't place implants on patients who had a history of periodontal disease or a history of smoking, it would cut down significantly yeah. which patients are getting implants because that's some of the main reasons people lose teeth. So I think it just comes down to utilizing these same tools, asking questions, learning their motivating factors to ensure that if they do move forward with an implant, they're going to be someone who could shift those behaviors because they want it that bad. If you're telling them they need it and telling them they should want it, pushing them through, but they're not really bought in, then those behaviors won't change more than likely. And you might end up with periimplantitis and failure of an implant down the line. So it's important to make sure you're gauging all of these same things that you're doing with any type of chair side that we've already kind of talked about and incorporating that into the implant side of things as well. When You're presenting implant dentistry. I think single tooth implant is really simple in terms of you you would do it very similarly to any other treatment plan that you're, you're sitting there chair side working on with a patient. If you're looking at, you know, like our office does a lot of full mouth implant dentistry. Um, You know, we're, we're going from hopeless dentition to full arch implant with prosthesis that's a different approach. And, you know, I'm grateful to work with a couple of doctors who really take their time in the presentation of that information. And so that's really where my role as implant care coordinator started. And and I know that's how we met originally was talking about Mm -hmm. all of that through the dental implants uncovered group and RDH innovations. And in that role, I work with the doctor to make sure that I'm a liaison for the patient. It's really awesome as a dental hygienist to be able to incorporate into a role like that because we have the clinical knowledge and we've seen implants that are healthy in someone's mouth. We've seen implants failing in someone's mouth. You know, we have that ability to relate to the patient and know what all the possible outcomes could be. You know, we understand where disease stems from, what the risks are. And I think, like you said, it's really important to have very real conversations with these patients prior to making a permanent transition in their dentistry, because they're going to be the ones in the end that that we work together, but it's primarily them that are going to be maintaining them over time. So in the process of presenting the treatment, presenting all of those aspects is going to be really important. But then when it comes to closing the case and and getting them to close on that sale so that, you know, because it is selling. I know we don't like to think of ourselves as salespeople, but you know, we're, we're selling, selling health. <laughs> we're selling a service. We're selling opportunity. We're selling our doctors as the appropriate providers to provide that service. So in the end, you know, once you've identified that, that this 
patient is going to be on board. It's going to be life changing for them. You know, they're going to get confidence again. They're going to get that promotion that they've been wanting. They're going to get that girlfriend that they couldn't get because they were missing front teeth. I mean, these are real (laughs) stories that walk through the door. And when you get to learn what their motivations are, I'm telling you, like, that's what seals the deal on the other side. If you can continue to take that emotional buy-in from them once they've shared it with you and apply it, it's, it's tremendous in terms of being able to close the case. Wow. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) What else you got there? I like, I like a list. (laughs) So the, I know I'm such a list person. I love it. Got to organize my thoughts. So the, you know, the biggest, I would say the biggest thing that people, when I ask them, you know, what are your concerns or what would your questions be about implants? When I'm talking about dental professionals, like dental professionals who say to me, like, it's just uncomfortable. I don't like talking about money. I don't like, you know, talking, I know they're going to be spending a lot of money on this. The biggest thing is cost. And I really think that the majority of the time, the cost barrier is stemmed by the provider's assumptions more so than the patient. So there are definitely patients that from a cost perspective, implants just are not going to be an option. Like it's, it's reality. It's unfortunate, but it's reality because we know it's really the ideal way to replace a missing tooth if possible at this point in time. But in reality, there's some people who aren't going to be able to do it financially. But I think that we overestimate how many patients there are in that boat. And I think it's because of our own assumptions and insecurities and talking about it. What I would hope is maybe even a little bit from today. And then (laughs) as people investigate, you know, communication styles and things further, you would be able to realize that you can have those conversations very confidently and we don't have to negate that concept of cost. When it comes to cost, it's really more about value. If someone values the treatment, they'll find a way. I've seen it time and time again with patients. Sometimes it's a year later or four years later or three months later, but it's not always no forever. A lot of times it's just no, not right now, but if you've built the value, they'll come back. And so cost is a barrier that's thrown out there. I think far more than it, than it truly is the barrier. Oh, that's a great point. And I'm definitely that hygienist. I I have (laughs) tiptoed around and I have been in those perio practices delivering $40,000 treatment plans. And I could just feel my confidence dive down, you know, like I couldn't find, cause I was projecting, I couldn't afford right. that. Right. Projecting it on my patient and it, you couldn't it afford it. But if you were to lose all of your teeth, Michelle, I might as, would I might you sell find house. a way? <laughs> <laughs> so, that will be my new mortgage. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going out stroking $50,000 checks either, <laughs> but, but you know, teeth. <laughs> As much as I value teeth, it is probable that I would find a way to make that happen. And, you know, that's the other thing as well is if you have, if you as a dental hygienist or someone in your practice is in this position where you are presenting implant dentistry, you are exactly right. I mean, it's going to range from, you know, five, six, seven thousand dollars for a single tooth. I've presented seventy five thousand dollar treatment plans like those are not normal, (laughs) They're, you know, they're the exception in most cases, but in reality, it can happen. It it can exist when you're talking about sinus augmentations and bone grafts and every single tooth in the mouth is coming out and the jawbones being rebuilt and implants are being placed. I mean, it's, it's expensive dentistry, but that's if you're talking about price. So there's a difference in talking about price and talking about value. And so shifting that conversation from price-based and cost-based conversation to building the value first. So if you mention the cost, a lot of times on a, on a phone call, if someone calls and asks about implants, we'll give a range. And there's some people that as soon as you give that range are out the door. And so unfortunately, I think too many people quote real quickly on the phone and it doesn't give people an opportunity to see like what they're getting for that money. So if you can negate quoting on the phone as much as possible, get them in the office, sit down, have a consultation. Um, You'll have the opportunity then to start to ask those questions that unravel what's motivating them. I can vividly remember one of my first cases as an implant care coordinator was a patient who is a mom. 
And she had a very just middle of the road job. Um, So this was a big deal for her. She knew this was coming. She'd been saving, but obviously not enough. So we were going to be talking about financing. But what she said to me, which stuck with me and really kind of worked in our favor in terms of helping her stay motivated, because it is hard. You have to encourage them throughout the whole process. It's a long process. She had tears in her eyes and said, I don't want my kids to think that I wasn't happy to be their mom because I don't smile in any pictures. And like, it makes me tear up, like even talking about it. I'm not crying. You're crying. (laughs) It's not me. I swear. I just, I just sneezed. That's all. It's not tear. But I mean, I've, I have, I have cried with patients numerous times because usually when people get into a situation and again, we're talking now about like a lot like implant dentistry extremes, but you know, when you're in that position where you're in hopeless, in a hopeless state, there's usually pretty strong emotions around that. So I always have a tissue box nearby (laughs) and, you know, you have to empathize with people. And, and I always tell them like, while we do this every day, like for you, I get that this is like a once in a lifetime, like heavily weighted decision. So just know that I'm carrying that weight as your liaison, just as much as I should be because this is a big deal for you. And I get that it's a lot of money. It's a lot of time, you know, the physical transitions that patients have to go through during that healing phase with implants. And that even happens with single tooth implants. You know, they have to modify the way they're talking, the way they're eating. You know, sometimes it's even just, where does my tongue live now (laughs) that things are different? Like it's, you have to adjust their speech can change. And if you just jump in and like, yeah, we can throw an implant in there. Come on in Tuesday. Like I got you (laughs) like patients. A lot of times are going to go along with it. You know, they're, they're just kind of like, okay, I know you have, you know, my best interests. You've been such a good dentist all these years, but they have a lot of reservations, a lot of anxieties going on inside that unless you, again, ask the questions and create the space for them to share those, they're not going to necessarily put them out there. And then those people are going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then call after hours and cancel their appointment because they don't want to (laughs) actually uh, talk to you about it. So you have to build the value um, to get past the price because the price is going to be generally what it's going to be. There's not a lot of big differences in the cost from one office to another when it comes to implants. So it's got to be more about them actually valuing the outcome. What we ask them a lot of times, what benefits do you see coming from this dentistry to really get them in that emotional headspace of, of what it's going to do to, to change their life, to make that investment because it's an investment. (laughs) I had a doctor that used to say the difference between major surgery and minor surgery, major is on me. Minor is on you. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Because when we were discussing this with patients, you know, I think it was his way of saying like, don't be so flippant about delivering these treatment plans because you're doing this every day. We're doing implant maintenance or implant surgeries every single day, but this is major for them. And yes, and you can't treat it minor because that's how it was. It's like, you'll be fine. Yeah. I took my daughter to, uh, I took my daughter to, a. She had a little bump by her belly button when she was like 18 months old. And my dad's like, she has a hernia, like take her to the doctor. (laughs) Okay, dad. So I went in and we ended up going to like a pediatric surgeon who evaluates these things. And he, of course, wanted to, you know, here's my mom brain, cut her open and just see what it is. (laughs) Oh, okay. Well, this is my like, not even two-year-old. I don't know about sedating her and cutting her belly open when you don't even know what it is. Like, can we do an ultrasound first? Like, where are we at? I was not there and he was trying to, to push it forward. And I still, to this day, she's nine. I remember him saying, I operate on micro preemie heart valves every day. This is no big deal. And I just was so offended by that because to me, this was huge. You were talking about like cutting open my daughter's abdomen and sedating her. And she's like barely speaking words. Like this was a big, big deal to me. So I think little things like that just resonate with me. And I try to put myself in that same situation or, or in those shoes, put myself back in that moment when I'm talking with patients, because they may ask some of the most trivial questions that may, that you're just like, what, but (laughs) 
And, you know, but you can't, you have to go, okay, but for them, that's a real question. That's a real truth. It's something they heard somewhere or created in their mind. And if you don't address it, then it's not going to go away. It's going to grow and manifest even more during the process. So, you know, just open the floor. Like, what concerns do you have? If someone's closed off, a lot of times what I'll do is share like some, you know, other patients have, have asked me questions like this. If I ask, what other questions do you have? And they're like, no, I'm, I'm good. I don't, I don't have any other questions. When you know that they have other questions, they're either just afraid to ask them or nervous or whatever. Don't know what to ask. They don't want to sound stupid. I will say that no offense to the docs that I work with because they're amazing. But when (laughs) the doctors leave the room is when all the questions really come out, as we all know, because they're afraid to ask in front of them and look dumb. But, you know, they can sit there with us, their liaison as a dental hygienist and feel more comfortable. So, you know, for me, it's just, you know, what questions do you have? And they say, I don't really have any more. Well, let me, let me share with you a few questions that other patients in your situation have had. And then let's see if that opens any doors for you. And then just throw some things out there. You know, some people will ask me how long they might need to take off work. Or some people will ask me, are they going to be sedated for this? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Am I going to be knocked out for this? <laughs> like, you know, so those are little questions that again, they may not have thought about or they had back there, but now you just ease them into feeling more comfortable with opening up and actually asking the questions that they want to ask. So you have to, you have to open the door though. And it's, it's that open-ended side of things that makes that happen. So in our final moments, I would love to have some of those closing phrases, like what are some things that I could start practicing or like things in my back pocket And if I understand you correctly, what I really need to understand is who I'm talking to first and foremost. Yes. (laughs) And then maybe tailor some of these things in my back pocket, or is there just some that are like, this works every time? So, I mean, I think the tell me more is amazing. Like that's a really super easy one to just always have in your back pocket. So when we have new team members that come on board, um, some of the main things that, that we talk about is exactly like you said, yes, knowing who you're talking to is very important um, because your delivery style matters, but kind of just go to phrases. Tell me more. What concerns you about that? Um, when we're talking about treatment acceptance itself, if you're chair side and you have that patient who was recommended, you know, an implant or a crown last time they were in, what do you recall about what doctor so-and-so recommended last time you were here? They may not even remember anything was recommended. So what do you recall about dot, 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 what's your understanding of dot, dot, dot. Another one that will buy you time if you're trying to come up with good, something good to say is using feel felt found. So a lot of people are familiar with this, but you can say, I understand how you feel. A lot of our patients have felt the same way. What we have found is whatever it may be. So it always, you always lead in with the same, you know, that the feel and the felt part is the same. And it gives you like a moment while you're saying that to like come up with your found and like how you're going to address that found to that particular patient. So that's another really, (laughs) it's an easy one. And it gives you that little like, um, but instead of sitting there going, um, <laughs> seeming like you don't know what you're doing. um, so, you know, anything that can really open that door. And then in the very end of it all, the bottom line is like, you have to ask them to schedule. It doesn't matter how much, when you're talking about case acceptance, it doesn't matter how much value you build into it, how many questions you've answered, how many questions you've asked. The conversation may have gone swimmingly. They seem to be totally on board, but if you don't, address that uncomfortable part of, so what, if anything would keep us from scheduling this for you today? And it still gives them an opportunity to present an objection. If one exists that maybe you haven't uncovered through the process, but it's also a very direct way of indirectly being direct (laughs) and asking them to schedule because it's either going to be, well, honestly, nothing. Like I think we've we've tackled it all. And other than, you know, going through the financing side of things, like there's really nothing left. Or you might get a little residual concern. You know, I mean, I, everything's been really good, but I'm still here. And a lot of times what you get is I need to go home and talk to my husband or I need to go home and talk to my wife or let me run it by so-and-so. 
So like for us, when we're doing treatment presentations, like the big ones, um, we call it a decision-making appointment when we have that case presentation and, and anyone who's going to facilitate in the decision-making process is requested to join. So we like to have the spouse, significant other caretaker, anyone who's going to be a part of that implant process at that appointment. So their questions can be answered as well, which helps that. Um, but if you're just chair side and you're, you're talking about a crown and they're on the fence, they're on board, they get it, why they need it. They want it. They've asked you for the treatment, which is great. But then they say, well, before I move forward, I do want to go home and think about it. And so then you can follow up with, so what clinical information can I provide for you that will help in that decision-making process at home? So that now you're going to understand, like, did I leave anything out clinically that they don't get, right? <laughs> so good. <laughs> <laughs> and if at that point there's nothing clinical, it's going to be, so what financial information would you like to have in considering the decision? And then they'll chat with, you know, then they're going to, it's usually going to be, they don't understand something clinically and value it, or there's something from the cost side that they feel a hang up on. Another phrase I like is just how much too much is it when you're presenting treatment and you tell them, you know, an implant's going to be $7,000 and it's like, oh, that is so much more than I expected. Well, tell me how much too much is it? And then they can be like, I don't know. I was thinking maybe it was going to be like three or four, seven is like double, you know, great. Well, if there was a way for us to be able to break up that additional amount that you didn't anticipate over a longer period of time, would that be helpful if this is in fact the treatment that you're looking for? So again, it's just solidifying that the value is there. I'll give you like two more follow-up questions that I often use. I could go on and on. Um, <laughs> That's good <you> stuff. Know, <laughs> a lot of times I'll ask them if they're still on the fence, you know, like I need to go home and think about it. I'll just say, well, let me ask you this. Do you feel like this is the treatment that you would like to have for yourself? Well, yeah, it sounds great. It sounds wonderful. Awesome. Okay. Well then do you feel like we're the right providers to work with on this journey towards this dentistry for you? And if the answer to that is yes as well, then more than likely it's really just some level of fear or anxiety that's holding them back at that point. Cause they're on board with the dentistry. They're on board with you as the care team to provide that for them. So again, there's something anxiety wise holding them back. So just take a minute to just kind of, I'm sensing a little hesitation, like point it out. I'm sensing a little hesitation. I want to be able to, while we have this time reserved, clarify some things for you. You know, what else can I help you with before you go today? And in reality, hundred percent of the time, they're not going to schedule, you know, it's not going to happen every time, but you have to ask and you have to be polite and assertive and actually driving towards closure and scheduling the patient. But then don't just dip after you schedule them. That's another sad thing that happens. Like, oh, cool. They're on board. Like, we don't care about them anymore. I hate when that happens. Like, you have to see them through all the way to the end. This can be a year-long process with implant dentistry. So, you know, being that care team for them and being available to them and letting them know that you're going to be there is super important. They need that that reassurance. Oh, that's good stuff. Man, I wish you could go on forever because there's just so many things I'm going to, I'm going to listen to this again and like take all of these notes. And, you know, I, I, I want to go back to how much you have to rehearse this and practice it and how this is not something that's just like, yeah, you got to work Miranda out. Those said, oh, I say this thing, it never comes out right. The first, time. at least it hasn't for me. <laughs> well, so I practice. think it's hard to, cause you don't want to overthink it. You know, there is, if you can get, that's why it's nice. Like you just asked, like, what are some of just go-tos that I can always have in my back pocket? So we have a lot of C's on our hygiene team here, or at least several. And again, go back and listen to that disc podcast because you have to know these things, but C's are very analytical. So you're thinking and overthinking everything throughout your conversation. And so we do, we, with our hygienists that have a stronger C style, we have those just go-tos, just use this go-to, just stick with this. Here's your three that you always fall back on. Um, otherwise they'll, they'll, you know, analysis paralysis and won't be able to move forward. So it is, it's practice. It is, it is practice, practice, practice. And I just firmly believe that the team should be practicing these things together. Like it's not just something that you can kind of rehearse in your head some of it's going to be practiced with your patients in the chair. And like you said, you learn from the ones that went well and the ones that didn't. Um, but if you have colleagues that you can, you know, like we did, I talked about that kind of book club style thing. If you have colleagues that are on board with learning this with you, 
and you can get together and, and just run through and practice, it really, really changes everything in terms of behavioral, ex- um, you know, changes with the patients, treatment acceptance. It is, it's a true game changer. And then you end up using it in your personal life too. <laughs> and then yeah. you're, then, I have a friend whose husband's like, don't Miranda me. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're doing. Don't Miranda me. <laughs> Don't ask me three questions and wait and <laughs> motivational interview me. <laughs> but it's such a good point. And gosh, I mean, we could talk forever. And if people are able to go back and maybe do you have any courses out there that they can go to? What are you doing now? Oh, goodness gracious. So <laughs> I'm so busy with like my job job, which is amazing because I love it. Um, there are a few things coming up this year. Um, I'm going to have something here locally in Virginia Beach. There's a study club that's having me speak. And then I'll be at the Georgia Dental Hygiene Association meeting in September. Um, pending travel is all good to go by then. Otherwise, I do work with RDH Innovations. They have an implant care practitioner program. We do something every fall and every spring. And um, I have a two course program. So I'm at the level one and the level two. And we talk a lot about DISC and motivational interviewing. And then also just how to develop that implant care coordinator role. If it's something that you see yourself transitioning to or working well within your practice. Oh, that's great. And you are also in the Facebook group, um, Dena, uh, Dental Implants Uncovered. Yes, Dental Implants Uncovered. If you're not in that group and you see implants, which nowadays who doesn't, yeah. you should totally be there because we are definitely um, on the forefront of clinical experience in terms of how to help maintain implants and how to help patients understand what they're getting into. So yeah, I love that group. Um, I've been a part of that group now for a few years and it's so nice to be surrounded by hygienists that are just really next level with trying to discover what's most appropriate. And like we said before, you know, just because you've always done it that way, that doesn't mean it's the right way to do it. I know that's how we met originally um, yeah. after I had introduced, um, I got introduced through Siobhan and Michelle, and we just have a really great group of people in that forum and not even just us as like the leaders of the forum, but the participants in that forum, the group members are awesome. Real critical they contribute, thinkers. Yeah. They contribute cases and, and it's so positive. I just love that. It's not like bickery and negative energy in there. It's, it's, it's open learning environment where it's okay to ask a question you're asking a question that maybe you would get judged by in, in some other forums online. Um, and I just really feel like we try to keep a really healthy community that's um, positive in that group. So yeah, you can find me there too. And then you can always email me if there's specific questions that you have. Um, my email is Miranda Beeson, ICC at gmail.com. So you can always shoot me an email if you have specific questions about where some of this inf- information came from or, you know, courses that are coming up and things like that. I could, again, talk about this for days. I love it. So anyone who wants to talk about it, I'm on board. <laughs> no, and maybe we'll have you back on and have a little follow-up or something so people can ask some live questions. You are great. We'll have all this information in the show notes for you guys. So definitely go check that out. You'll also be able to get your CE credit there as well. Miranda, thank you so much. You are the best. You're so good at this. And we're, it's such a blessing to have you in our profession teaching us this. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me on. And it was really nice to meet you, Andrew, for the first time and see you again, Michelle. And I'm super excited to be a part of it. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I have no doubt some of you left with some amazing pearls from that little podcast. For sure. You know, I I almost wish I could redo a lot of my time as in full time dentistry or full time clinical dentistry, and just apply some of these things that I keep learning. I think I would have been so much less frustrated and worried because it was a real concern for me to deliver some of these, you know, big cases. So when that thing said forty thousand dollars, I would have like a slight panic attack going in there trying to deliver that treatment plan. <laughs> But that, I mean, that's the part of the thing about this podcast and about um, Miranda and all the other things that are out there. Like we have people like Miranda who, who are really good at it and who will teach us how to do those things. Like the only reason why we're so scared and uncomfortable is because it's new and different. Mm-hmm. And we've talked about this before, like a long time ago, but sometimes we project our own insecurities about money and what people can afford onto the patient when that we shouldn't be doing that. 
But I'm so grateful that we have people like Miranda and strong personalities and analytical personalities who are like, this is the way you guys, this is how to do it and how yeah. to do it properly. And I like that she makes the patient a partner in mm -hmm. all of the conversation, not like you don't talk at them. Yes. You include them in the, in the discussion. And that is so important. And we talked a lot about motivational interviewing in this as well. She's a great teacher with that. Um, and then you can also go back to our episode with Rebecca Lang, Dr. Rebecca Lang. If you just uh, look on our website and Google that or put in that search bar, Rebecca Lang, you'll get that episode uh, that we did with mo on motivational interviewing, which I thought was great. And that has honestly turned around a lot of my home care delivery. And it's pretty spectacular to see and feel that change. I'm not good at it. I still have to practice. If I go a month without seeing patients because I'm traveling or something and I come back into it, I really have to like think hard about an open-ended question because I just want to give it, give them the information. I'm like, oh, nope, shut it down, Michelle. Shut your mouth. Let them tell you. <laughs> it's hard sometimes, but if I always, my goal is always asking permission before I do things. Can I lay you back? Is it okay? I would like to lay you back. Is that okay? If I see anything that it's a concern in your mouth, is it okay to let you know about that today? You know, if I see any changes that need to occur with what you do at home, is that okay to let you know about that today? And no one has told me, no, I'm waiting. I'm patiently waiting for that one time that they tell me no. And no one has. And in fact, they all are like, yeah, absolutely. And then when I'm in there, they're like, what's it look like? How's it look? And it's really kind of fun to get that experience versus the like, oh, she's going to tell me to floss again. I'm not going to be <laughs> pausing. It's really nice. So I encourage y'all to give it a try. And anything else, Andrew? I think that's it. Okay. That's all I have. All right. Well, we, we are really excited that you've joined us for this episode. We would love for you to also follow us on Instagram and Facebook. You can find us also on LinkedIn. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to send it to either Michelle at a tale of two hygienist.com or Andrew at a tale of two hygienist.com. There's S's on that end of that hygienist, just so you know. And also our website is a tale of two hygienist.com where you can find a lot of our CE episodes, our mission trip episodes, a lot of uh, online stuff like our science Sunday and our chair side chats and any lives that we have done is all on our website. You're welcome to go do that. And we would so much appreciate and love if you could leave us a rating and review like Lucy did that you read or heard at the beginning of this. That'd be really great. I think that's it, Andrew. That is it. Have a great week, everybody. Bye, y'all.